Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today to Behind the Scenes at MD with Jen. I am Jen Geressi, Chief Operating Officer of Advanced Research Media, which of course publishes Muscular Development and Fitness Rx. Today on Behind the Scenes, we have an amazing special guest for you. He is the MD online editor and senior writer of Muscular Development Magazine and the host of the Ronline Report, as well as Ask Ron Live. Please welcome to show today. Sorry for my stammering here. Live. <laughs> <laughs> Live. You gotta love it. Please welcome to the show today, Ron Harris. Thank you, Ron. Jenny. Thank you so much for being on the show today. Thanks so much for having me. Here we are. What, it, it what would you like to know? <laughs> it is an absolute honor, first of all. Um, I just want to tell you that it is wonderful to call you both colleague and good friend. And I'm so glad that you're here today on our show to talk about your experiences in bodybuilding and journalism, and as well as to get into the nitty gritty about behind the scenes of MD. Sure. sure. Let's tell them everything. Where do we begin? All right. All right. Let's do this. Um, well, first of all, I, I said it before. We had a little glitch, guys, before. I apologize for that. Um, but I, you didn't get to hear this, so I'm going to say this again. Muscular development has been awarded the silver play button for content creation, and we are just absolutely over the moon. And congratulations to you, Ron. I know that we're, you're getting one in the mail very shortly. Um, so you, absolutely, you need to do a unboxing for us so that we can <laughs> see your reaction and put it up and do all that fun stuff. Yeah, I never got anything from YouTube before, that's for sure. Well, I just think it's amazing. It's well-deserved and congratulations. Thank you. And it's, it's a team effort. You know, you do so much behind the scenes. These people Thank see you. me, they see my mug all the time, but they don't realize you're editing the videos, you're monitoring the live chats, you're putting out the socials, you know, you do so much. I couldn't even, I couldn't work as hard as you, Jen. I'm not that hard a worker. So God love you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ron. And don't sell yourself short. I mean, when you were on the contest, you're running back and forth, you know, everywhere, talking to everybody. You're working, you know, 10 to 16 hours a day. I mean, you are really pushing it, so. Contest, well contest coverage is a different story, but yeah, we don't have that many of them, but yeah, those, those weekends are, they're fun, they're challenging, they go by so fast, like you wouldn't believe it. It's like you're getting off the plane, then you're getting back on the plane to go home, like four or five days just went by in a whirl. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. I mean, it's a lot of work, but it's also a lot of fun. Oh, and yeah. I think we have, you know, the fact that we all gel so well together. Uh, is one of the reasons why we get everything done so well and so quickly. And we just have a fantastic time doing it. Yeah. I mean, it's like I said, it's, it's a lot of work, but it's fun because it's, you know, being bored is probably the worst thing. And you're never, those weekends, you don't have time to be bored. It's just go, 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 go. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. But speaking of bodybuilding, yeah. let's talk about your start in bodybuilding. I know from our conversations that we've had, you started in bodybuilding when you were about 14 years old. Is that right? Yeah, I started lifting um, at home when I was 13. I'd asked my parents for a weight set for Christmas. So that would have been 1984, Christmas 1984. Uh, it, came, it came with a little manual, little illustrations of what to do in the muscle groups. And I was just fascinated. You know, I had no idea what I was doing. I wasn't working the whole body or anything like that. Uh, by 14, I was training with a friend at his house after school, went to a boys club, but I just fell in love with it because it, it was a way for me to finally change my body. And I'd always been a shorter kid. I'd always been very small. I didn't, you know, I was a late bloomer. I didn't, I hit puberty a couple of years after pretty much all the other kids. So, and I was never any good at sports. So I wanted something until I found wrestling, but that was like the very end of high school. I found some way to put more muscle on my body to make my body bigger. And to me, that was, you know, it wasn't bodybuilding for me at then. I wasn't really aware of bodybuilding, but I had seen as a kid pro wrestlers. And those are, those are huge motivations for me. They were these big, strong guys beating each other up, throwing each other around big muscles, guys like, uh, this is before wrestling went huge, but I used to watch guys like uh, Ivan Putsky, Polish power, Superstar Billy Graham, Jimmy Superfly, oh, Snuka, wow. even Hulk Hogan back then. He was a bad guy. He wasn't, 
he wasn't the big star he became later. <laughs> I but remember that. Yeah, they were all they had these larger than life physiques and personas. And uh, they were a huge inspiration to a little kid like me. So uh, I didn't discover bodybuilding per se, as we know it, until I had just started my freshman year of college at the University of California, Santa Barbara. And I bought a jug of Weider weight gain powder. And on the side, there was something you could rip off and send back to them. And they would send you a free issue of Flex magazine. So I sent it off. That was probably like July or what. Didn't even think twice about it. But my mother would forward all my mail to me in Cal from, from Boston to California. And it came in the mail. I think I'd been at school for a week. And I opened it up. And uh, the people inside at that time. So this was fall, September of 1987. So you had Lee Haney, uh, Lee Labrada, Rich Gaspari, Mike Christian, Barry DeMay, Mike Quinn, so many, so many great physiques back in the in the mid to late 80s. Sean Ray, who hadn't even turned pro yet, had a pictorial in there. And I was just, I was just oh, flabbergasted wow. at these physiques. So much so that I, I cut them all out, taped them all up to uh, the wall of my room. My roommate didn't know what to make of that. I ran to the to the campus books, it was off campus bookstore got the first two books I could find on bodybuilding. One was the Nautilus bodybuilding book and the Nautilus advanced bodybuilding book. And uh, I read them, I read both of them in the space of like two days. You know, I was supposed to be reading my school books, but I'm sure I was still getting my work done. I got straight A's in college, but uh, wow, I was, I was into it. I was so, I was, I was hooked. And I knew from that moment on, I want to look like those guys. I want to compete. And uh, bodybuilding, bodybuilding was going to be my thing, no matter how long it took to look like that, how hard I had to work, I was never, ever going to give up. And I never did, because that was 1987. And we're in 2021 now. Wow. Wow. Yeah. It's been a minute. Yeah, been a minute. <laughs> Definitely been a minute. So when did you start competing? When so was your we, first competition? Yeah, um, I, I knew in my head I want to compete, but I had no idea, like, how do you compete? Where do you compete? Had no idea. And my second year of college at, at Emerson, I wasn't training at a, at a gym, a bodybuilding gym. I didn't know any bodybuilders. I was training at uh, a YMCA on uh, next to Northeastern University in Boston. And I specifically joined there because they had a Nautilus Center, a Nautilus room, because those books for a couple of years had me brainwashed. Arthur Jones was a hell of a salesman into believing that the only way to build muscle and muscles and strength and all that the only effective way was Nautilus machines. He really sold you on the idea that free weights for these obsolete tools like the for from the Paleolithic era or something. So uh, I did pick up a magazine because I was already buying them. Every time the magazines would come out, this I knew exactly what day they came out and I'd go to the newsstand and pick them up. And I saw one called Natural Bodybuilding. Uh, I think it was I think it was just called Natural Bodybuilding. And immediately I said, huh, I look a lot more like the young guys, the teenagers in this magazine, because I'm 19 at the time, than I do these guys in Flex Magazine and Muscle and Fitness and Iron Man. And I don't think I had seen MD. Yeah, I had seen MD. But I knew right away there's a difference between these natural physiques and the other ones. So if I'm going to do a show, maybe I should do a natural one. In the back, they had a schedule. And I saw there was one not far, you know, a 40-minute drive from me coming up in a few months. I said, I'll do that. I had no idea about the diet, posing. I totally winged it. I showed up at the show. This is March 1989 was my first contest. It was the ANBC Colonial Cup. ANBC, they're, they're, out, they're long gone now. It stood for American Natural Bodybuilding Conference. They were primarily in the Northeast USA. It's also the organization that Jose Raymond started out in and his older brother Tito, who's my age, who I, I competed against Tito. Yeah, uh, he was talking about that the other day on No Way Jose. Well, yeah. And uh, yeah, Tito was great back then. It, it really did. It, it was my third show that I went up against Tito. And I shouldn't say went up against because I never got near him on stage. There were these shows were big back then bodybuilding because that's all there was. It was just bodybuilding. There was no classic physique. There was no men's physique. If you were going to compete, you were going to be a male bodybuilder or a female bodybuilder. That was it. No other options. Wow. So okay. and it, this particular show didn't have a uh, a junior class or a, or a teenage class. So I had to go in the men's open at age, I think I just turned 20. And when I found out Tito was my age, I got so depressed because I looked at him. He was second place out of 20 guys. And I was, you know, I don't know, 18th, I don't know. But to find out that this, this, this guy was my age, it was such, I was so crestfallen because I was like, man, he's so much better than me, so much bigger. He looks like a bodybuilder and I'm still, still trying. 
but uh, I, I didn't I didn't quit. I competed for a total of 24 years from 1989 to 2013. I did about 25 or 30 shows. And uh, over time, I did pretty well. I ended up top five at the national level uh, four or five times in the in the Masters and the Open, uh, all at Team Universe. That was the show that I, I had my best showings at. But, uh, you know, it was it was a great time. I don't I don't regret competing all those years. And uh, it, I made so many friends, had so many great experiences. And I learned so much about my body and how to how to manipulate things because I never had a coach. I was always my coach. Wow, that is an amazing career run. Yeah. That's incredible how you got started and how you progressed along the way from you know, beginning and looking into natural bodybuilding to all the way right up until you retired, I think in 2013. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. I was uh, almost 44 years old. Yeah, right on the couple months away from turning 44 when I retired. You know, not to say I would never do it again. I would do it again, but you know, it's not a priority anymore. It's not something that, uh, you know, my job keeps me very busy uh, competing. Just to say the least. Yeah, to say the least. So uh, <laughs> people say, When's it, when are you making a comeback, this and that? I said, well, two things would happen. Either my job would suffer or my prep would suffer. And I, I either, neither one of those is, is acceptable to me. Both scenarios are unacceptable. I can't slack at my job. And I would never compete unless I could give it 100% and do it, do my best and look the best I could possibly look. I would never get up there again if I, if I couldn't. It's, it would be pointless. A strong mindset. I totally respect that. Now, I want to talk about your journalism career. Did you always know you wanted to be a writer from the start? No, no. Uh, going into college, I was a film major. I wanted to work in film. No major, uh, really? Film wow. major. You know, my my real aspiration was to be a film director. So I did go to film school. Uh, made a couple of short films for college and this and that. But once I started learning about that industry. It became a little less attractive to me just because I saw how these, I met some of them, some of the people that worked in film because I was in LA and it was just, it's very, uh, it's very time consuming. They, they don't see their families very much when they're on product in, in production. Um, but it sort of all led to me working for, cause it, this is how I got into this industry in senior year. Um, you could do your final semester of college at Emerson at, they called it the Emerson LA program. You would have to take just two courses a week, uh, whatever courses were offered. And the rest of the time you would intern somewhere related to your major. And I had been watching this show on ESPN called American Muscle Magazine. It was a one hour show. It was uh, monthly. Yes. And, uh, you know, to me, it was, wow, I could watch it. I used to tape it and watch it over and over. They had contest coverage, workouts, profiles, uh, cooking segments, uh, gossip, all kinds of things. And um, I said, I, I'd love to intern at this place. So I made a little demo reel on VHS, sent it out to the producer of the company, the owner and producer of the company, Luz Wick. Uh, he had American Sports Network, still does. And uh, he said, yeah, come on down. We'll, we'll, I'll take you on. So that was January of 91. And uh, I began immediately writing scripts for the show, like from day one. That's what they had me do because they they asked, can you write? I said, yeah, I, I can write. I, I think, you know, fake it till you make it kind of thing. So the very first thing they put me on was, I think they were they were just putting out the Ms. Olympia one hour special and they needed all the all the voiceovers written for that, for the, the voiceover guy. So I wrote all those up and started writing scripts for the show as an intern, as a college kid. I was still in college and uh, I was supposed to be there for the semester and then go back to Boston. And I stayed out there 10 years because he offered me, I never went home. <laughs> he offered me a position with the company because a oh, couple, wow. couple of the guys that were the producers, they were disgruntled and they were wow. fed up and I, they didn't quite quit at the time, but they, they weren't doing as much. So he needed help. So they made me an associate producer. So I'm 21 years old, just out of college. And he has me going out to, you know, Venice beach, gold gym, oh, world gym, oh. shooting workouts and interviews doing contest coverage, interviews at the shows. And we covered big shows back then. ESPN used to do one hour event shows for Nationals, USA, Mr. Olympia, Ms. Olympia, Arnold Classic. So right away I was thrown into, you know, I was able to meet everybody in the sport, all the, all the pro athletes, 
uh, the magazine owners, the photographers, supplement company owners. That's how I met Steve Blackman was when I worked for Lou early on. I met Steve. That's incredible. Wow. And uh, it was it was a great opportunity. I was there from 91 to 98. Uh, and I started writing on the side while I was doing that job for American Sports Network. And how that came about is we went down to Iron Man Magazine. used to have a headquarters in Marina Del Rey, California, uh, before they moved up to Oxnard. Now, unfortunately, they're, they're no longer a print magazine. But Lonnie Teeper, who was their gossip columnist, and he used to do a lot of the cover stories and profiles and things like that. We were doing a segment with Lonnie where he was doing a preview of the 92 Iron Man Pro Invitational, because Iron Man Magazine used to also promote a pro bodybuilding show. It was always the first show of the season. It was always a week or two before the Arnold. So it was a big deal. And while I was there, we did a little segment walking around the Iron Man headquarters. And um, at the end of it, I said to Steve Holman, who was the editor, I said, just out of curiosity, Steve, uh, how, how would I go about trying to get into your, as a, as a writer for your magazine, an article or something? He goes, well, submit something to me. We'll see if we like it. If we like it, we'll publish it. We'll pay you. I'm like, oh, all right. Well, cool. So this is the days of word processors, fax machines. We didn't have all the technology we had now, but I sent it off. Yeah, I remember. He accepted it. And uh, pretty much from, from that time on, I was in there every month as a contributor to Iron Man. And then from there, I started writing for Muscle Mag International. I did hundreds and hundreds of articles for them and their fitness magazine. And uh, I left uh, the TV job, TV production in 98, had to do, I had a, a, another, my second child on the way, so I had to pick up some more money. The writing wasn't enough at the time to sustain the bills. Uh, so I had to become a trainer for about a year and a half, almost two years, but I was still writing a lot. And um, by 2000, by fall of 2000, right before I moved back to Boston, I was a full-time writer and that's all I've done for for work ever since. I haven't had to train people or do anything else. And I started with MD. Uh, if that was a, if that's a question, I, the story. How that I, was the next question. Yes, you hit yeah, that right on the head. <laughs> it's, a, it's a it's a funny story. We used to have a Steve used to hire have a writer named Josh Brown who went by the name The Sandwich. You know, anyone anyone who was sandwich. reading, yeah, anyone The Sandwich he called himself. <laughs> so anybody who was a uh, read the magazines back in. He did a lot for him. He used to do mostly for MD. I think he did some stuff for Muscle Mag, but very brash style. He would ask these outrageous questions, things I would never ask people, just sex life questions, things like I you'd cringe reading it. But uh, he was doing a lot of work for Steve and he asked me, he started pawning work off on me. He's like, I don't want to do all these columns. Can you do them? And he'd send me the, he'd interview the guys and just send me the, I think this was back. This is how back in time we're going, early 2000s. I think he would mail me the tapes or something. Anyway, I did that. And then one day he said, the first byline I had, the first article that I wrote that had my name on it was, uh, he didn't want to do it. He was getting lazier. Uh, I don't know. I don't know why he didn't want to do it. But if you know who Jenna Jameson is, she was the top adult film star of the time. Um, I don't know if she's still the top top grossing one of all time or what but Jenny I James, have heard of her in the past yeah yeah so I had done I had already done uh three interviews with adult film actors for Muscle Mag and T Mag leading up to this so that's why he thought of me for the job for the assignment <laughs> because you know I knew what to ask and I, I they were fun interviews because when do you get the chance to ask these people about their jobs and I just found it fascinating it's true so it's an interesting subject so he had Jenna Jameson lined up for an interview, but he didn't want to do it. He says, do you want to look? Yeah, all right. And um, I contacted, he gave me the contact for her agent to set up the interview. And I'll never forget because I was on the phone with the agent on the morning of September 11th, 9-11. And we're talking about, wow. you know, we're going back and forth about her availability. You know, maybe you can talk to her then, this and that. And he says, turn, he says, oh my God, turn on your, turn on your TV. I said, what are you talking about? He goes, a plane just crashed into the World Trade Center. I'm like, what? No, it didn't. Shut up. I thought he was messing with me. But that's, so that was, uh, wow. and I think I interviewed her a couple of weeks after that. And that was the first thing I had published in MD. So 9-11 was 2001. So I think my first published article in MD was. That's almost uh, 20 years ago. Yeah, it would have been end of 2001 or beginning of 2002. 
So yeah, and then you know, Steve Steve saw uh, some potential in me as a writer, I guess. And he had, he was, I think I had made a name for myself. I already had a couple thousand articles published at that time. Oh, just but, some, Ron, really? Yeah, I mean, because <laughs> you know, I remember I won't say who it was, but some another writer, an older guy. I had told him I'm going to be a writer and this is going to be my full-time thing. He says, good luck with that. He really was, he didn't encourage me. He discouraged me. He said, there's not enough money in it to do it. You have to have something else, some other job, and then you can write on the side. I said, no. Wow. And he said, yeah, they don't pay enough. And I said, what if I wrote a lot of articles though? And I did. And I used to keep track when I was a freelancer for all those years, I had folders and uh, there were, there were many years where I would write over 200 articles a year. Uh, sometimes it was closer to 300 articles a year, which, you know, 365 days in a year. So it was a lot of articles, but I was able wow. to, I was able to make it a full-time thing. And, you know, I wasn't a millionaire, but I was doing, I was doing pretty well as a freelancer there for, for a while, for sure. That is extremely well for a freelancer, because as we know, you know, there's the old adage, you don't get rich with writing, right. um, <laughs> unless you, you get very lucky and you hit that bestseller. Unless you're Stephen, um, my idol, Stephen King, same birthday as me. Yeah. Oh, there there you go. There you oh, go. Stephen King. Very good example. I mean, no, Stephen King, but getting back to Stephen King just for a second. I mean, what we forget about Stephen King is that when he first started writing, he was a janitor. Yeah. Yeah. He lived in, in Maine. A, he lived in a trailer. True story. Yeah. And he just had a dream and the ambition and he did it. And the rest is history. Yeah. So my personal belief with that is as long as you keep at it, and as long as you just keep plugging away and doing what you need to, anything can pay off especially writing and you prove that by the amount of articles that you write yeah and i've had and so, so many guys have come up have contacted me saying how do i become a writer how do i get in the magazines you know what's the secret to your success and there's no everyone's got a different path to it i believe and um but i always put it this way i'm not the best writer i'm i would never put myself in the in the category of someone who was as gifted with prose as a as a Peter McGough, as a Julian Schmidt. There are people that are better writers technically and, you know, but I have a work ethic and editors, this is in the magazine, in the magazine era, which, you know, we're the last print magazine now, but at that time I was a freelancer, there were, you know, six or six or eight major magazines and then probably another 10 that were lesser. And I wrote for pretty much all of them at one time or another. I said, editors like to give you an assignment and then not have to think about it. They don't have to check up on you. When's it coming? And they give you a deadline. And they always knew with me, I, I had a track record. If you gave me an assignment, uh, we need a Jay Cutler arm training article. We need it by March 5th. They knew they were going to have a Jay Cutler article by March 5th. It was going to be good enough so that any editing it needed would be very light, if at all. And uh, they could count on you. And that's what they like. Whereas a lot of people... They don't have a work ethic with writing. They want to wait till they're inspired. They want to wait for the right moment. Uh, you know, you can't, you can't treat it that way. You have to treat it like a job and you sit That's down right. and here's my, you know, the hardest thing is that blank it used to be a blank page on the typewriter, but now it's a blank screen. You have to be able to look at that blank screen and not just sit there with writer's block as they, as people like to call it, you just start writing, just get it done, get it done. And that's, you know, 5,000 5, articles later, that, that's here, here we are. I would say that is extremely solid advice for any budding journalist writer who is thinking about writing or is scared about writing. It's, it's true. You just need to dive in and do it. And aside from the articles, you have written books. I yeah. know that yeah. on the Dr. P show, you have real bodybuilding, if you want to put that up. Hold it up. Oh, well. And I believe there was uh, another book you, sh you showed me this book um, when I first started MD. I think it's called Evil Times 10. It's a horror story. Yeah. See, yeah. this I have, I had published, self published. So this is an actual book you can hold in your hands. Um, it's available on Amazon.com, Real Bodybuilding. But Evil, Evil Times 10 is also available. But I, I self published that only in digital format. So it's on, you know, Kindle or wherever people can download and, and read books. But I have more. I don't want to say I don't love the type of writing I do for MD and that I've done all these years. I have a great passion for bodybuilding and the athletes and all that. I, I do. I do love that. But uh, fiction writing, as you know, you're a fiction writer, Jen. 
um, it's a different it's a different experience. It's a different type of satisfaction. You can actually create a whole world. You can create these characters and make them real really live on the page uh, or on the computer screen. It's it's to me. I take a lot more pride in that writing because it, it is a lot more difficult. And you know, you can go back and, and edit over, you can go back to your stories or your novel, and you're never 100 percent satisfied. You can always find something like oh, oh, that that is totally the truth. I mean, with with this one right here, potholes, mm. I cannot tell you how many times back and forth I went with the editor and you know kept proofreading it and kept adding to it. It was like an ongoing totally ongoing process until we were ready to publish yeah and while you're writing something like that it consumes you in a way because you'll be trying to fall asleep and you'll think of something that you want to put in it or or take out or change and you have to get up and make the note about it or else you're going to forget about it before you wake mm -hmm. up or you might wake mm -hmm. up to go to the bathroom at three in the morning and something comes to you you got to go write that yes. down because it's just uh it, it's a whole other world the fiction fiction to me and i i, I i'll do more of it i i i kick myself for having gone so long without writing anything new but uh yeah I, I love it i mean i wish more people had read it because it's a whole different facet uh you know you, you're allowed to do so much more because it's it's you have free reign there's no limits you don't have to follow any format you don't have to dumb it down for anybody it's it's uh there's just a lot more freedom and horror is the genre i love i love horror horror has been my my consuming passion long before I knew about weights or Bible or anything like that. I remember you telling me that. I mean, my earliest, some of my earliest memories are probably being like three years old, being up at night watching uh, old universal horror movies in black and white, like Dracula, Frankenstein, Creature from the Black Lagoon, The Wolfman. Uh, man, I could not get enough of horror. And to this day, I can watch, I'll watch a hundred horror movies that are horrible just to what to find that one gem. And I I do it all the time because most of them are crap. But when you find that one good one, it's it's such a such a reward. I'll tell you, Ron, you and my husband need to hang out. You really uh, do, because between the two of you right. with horror, yeah. you guys could have conversations to last forever. I know that right off the bat. Yeah, I mean, uh, <laughs> all, all, most of my tattoos are horror themed. They have the Exorcist there. Uh, that's the Evil Dead 2 movie poster right there. Oh, wow. Yeah. Do I have any more? These are just regular demonic scary things but yeah i mean to me halloween one of the biggest i don't want to down i don't want to downplay how bad the pandemic was for the world in general but one of the worst things for me was that halloween haunts and stuff were if not canceled they were watered down so much because i love being scared i love going to those things i'm like i'm still like a little kid i'm 50, i'll be 50 i was 51 years old we did go to one I know it's fake. I know it's just guys and girls in makeup and masks and everything, but I Halloween. love those pictures that you post of you and your wife on Facebook <laughs> in your costumes. They're, they're absolutely incredible and so inventive. Thank you. Yeah. Last Halloween was the first time I think, geez, maybe my life that I didn't dress up. They didn't put any kind of makeup or costume on. I was, uh, I was kind of bummed, but there was nowhere to go. <laughs> and nobody came to the door for trick or treating. So yeah. Now Hopefully guys, 2021 that changes and you'll be able to do that. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Just what, curious, does Marty, does Marty drag you to those, the haunts? Sometimes we do. Sometimes yeah. we do. There is a um, haunted house that happens every year in Wading River, which is about um, 15, 20 minutes from where I am. Mm -hmm. And they have this old haunted house and it's, it's all rickety and it has the sound effects and there's the, the dry ice yeah. and the, cornfield and you'll go out in the cornfield and <laughs> Texas Chainsaw Massacre will chase you <laughs> and people will come out of the walls and they they really put on an amazing show those kids are so talented and mm -hmm. um, we try to go every year to support them because those they're just amazing at what they do so I forget the name of the actual house but it is the haunted house in Waiting River for all of you people on Long Island um, so, Speaking of Long Island, how far are you from Amityville? Oh, yeah, that is easy. Uh, 45, 90 minutes, depending okay. on traffic. Yeah, I would sit out there on Halloween with a candle. That's what I would do. <laughs> you want to know something? When yeah. my husband um, was on his previous job before he got sick, one of his clients was right next door to the Amityville Horror Shop. Wow. Yeah. Did they have anything to report? No, nothing. He, he said that 
um, the new owners, new people have bought it. Yeah. And they've renovated it. So you can't tell it's the Amityville Horror House any longer because it looks totally different from the way it used to. Dang, because of those those windows and everything. It's such a such an iconic image, that house. You show that that picture of the just the house with those windows, and everybody knows exactly what it is. But I do know somebody who went to the house when they um they were putting it up for sale and they invited people to come to the house and buy artifacts from the house. Yeah. Like mm -hmm. bricks or whatever. And one of my friends, his name is Timothy Shelf. Um, he is actually a, believe it or not, he's a ghostbuster. He oh, goes around oh, doing paranormal oh, investigations. Yes. Good for him. And uh, he bought a brick from the Amityville Horror House. Hmm. <laughs> and he has that in his house. I was like, uh-uh, no. <laughs> wow, but what a racket. They must have been able to sell, you know, thousands of bricks and pieces of wood. And wow, good for them. Oh, I think they made out like bandits easy. <laughs> totally. I think they totally made out like bandits easy. Yeah, ghost hunter, that paranormal investigator. See, I'm, I'm fat. I watch all those shows too. And I would never, I've been invited by some people to go along on those things. I wouldn't do it just because I do believe in all that stuff. I'm not, I'm not, I'm a believer in ghosts and cryptids like bigfoot loch ness and the demonic and i believe uh, it's too dangerous i wouldn't go into anywhere any location where something otherworldly could possibly form an attachment to you and then you take it back to your house and now it's going to infest your home and bother yeah, the want that. people you love so yeah, yeah. If you, you guys definitely think don't want that <laughs> i'm telling you you need to hang out with my husband Mario, if we go to, if we end up going to a show i'll bring marty with you and the two of you can talk and have Olympia. Uh, okay, now. I, I should bring him on camera. Yeah. Marty, you want to come on camera? Unfortunately, I can't see the camera. <laughs> That's another. You can't see. All I see is a black screen says Jen Jurisi. Jurisi. But I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but let's talk about, I wanted to ask you about Ronline. We were talking about that a little bit before, you know, the first stream cut out. Yeah. How did you come up with the Ronline? What was the idea for the Ronline? So the act, first, I got to I have to give credit to the late Peter McGough. Uh, he came up with that title for me, uh, and you know, at the time, I sort of dismissed it. Said that's silly, Ron Line Report, but it really grew on me. It became a thing, and now I can't imagine what else would we even call what would we call the interview thing. But uh, my predecessor David had done a couple interviews uh, for our YouTube channel. He was uh, the online editor before me, and I think. Uh, I don't know if it was Steve's idea or my idea, but you know, we wanted to get that going again. And me being not as technically proficient as a lot of other people, it took me a few months to figure it out, how to do it, the, uh, the Skype and the recording and the split screen and the backdrop. It took me a long time and there were a lot of, uh, uh, you know, you apologize because we had a glitch and we had to restart this after four minutes. I had to redo probably at least six to 10 full interviews in that time span because I thought it was recording and it wasn't, or the audio wasn't recording or I screwed oh. up somehow. There was a, there was a learning curve. And um, once I finally got it rolling, it's, it's, they're easier now. And, you know, you've even helped me with, I was on Skype and I was resistant to switching to zoom just because yeah. I was, I finally figured out Skype and how to work on Now you want me to do this other, other format. But it's it's the quality. We just we just switched to Zoom about a week ago, I think, and the quality is so much better. But uh, it's it's important because you know you, you can't rely print magazines as we know we're the last one. People just don't they don't read as much as more as they just like to watch things. And YouTube proves that the the views and the the subscribers. Uh, so I knew that an interview format would be a lot more have a more of a reach than the print magazine potentially could have and man I, I think you tallied up I'm almost at 500 of them now that's know. right you're hitting your 500th Ron line very wow. soon wow. Yeah. when we get closer to it we're going to do the countdown like we did for Dr. T <laughs> wow yeah I mean who would I have on as a 500th oh. well, well that's had... a question yeah that's a question um I'd like to ask you I mean you've had a lot of guests on the Ron line yeah. Who would be your absolute dream guest Arnold. to have on the run line? Arnold. There you go. Drop the mic, Arnold. I knew it. I and knew I, it. I did interview Arnold for Muscular Development a couple of years back. However, that was on the phone um, and I recorded it. 
I didn't see him while we were talking. And to this day, I don't know if he knows who I am, what I look like. He had a lot of, uh, you know, I, I think I went over the topics beforehand with, uh, might've been Bob Lormer, but Arnold knew exactly the, the topics he wanted to discuss, what he wanted to get across. So it wasn't so much an interview as uh, me. I, would, I, I think I got in like four questions and he talked for, it was a good 45 minutes. And it was fascinating to sit there and listen to him. Believe me, I'm like, I'm on the phone with Arnold Schwarzenegger. I was about to, you know, explode. With, <laughs> uh, I couldn't believe it was happening. But if I could have him on Ron Lane and see him as we talked, man, that would be, that'd be great. I would love that. Because <laughs> he's, you never know. Yeah, you know, you, we talk about the greatest bodybuilders of all time, but nobody had the impact that Arnold did because he was a major movie star. He's a governor. He's, you know, he's one of those people. You could say Ronnie to anyone in the world and they were like, huh, Ronnie who? But you say Arnold, every person in the world knows who you mean when you say Arnold. Right. He transcended bodybuilding. He became a superstar. He became a you know, if, if we didn't have that that uh, part in the Constitution about having to be born in the USA, I think he would have been president by now. I'd vote for him. You, you know something? I, I totally believe that. If we didn't have that clause in the Constitution, I think Arnold would have run for president yeah. if he had the ability to. But as a governor of California, I mean, he did amazing uh, things for that state. Yeah. He, he did incredible legislation for them. He, he really was an amazing governor for California in the amount of time that he was. Mm -hmm. um, and also he was very active in politics even before that. Right. So, right. you know, I think even he could probably get a cabinet position um, eventually. Yeah. Yeah, why not? I mean, that, you don't have to be uh, U.S. born to do that. Uh, Henry Kissinger, he wasn't U.S. born. Well, that's was, right. Yeah. <laughs> Henry, I forgot about Henry Kissinger. Jim Belush, John Belushi used to to him on uh, SNL back in the early days. Oh, yeah, that's <laughs> right. That's right. Hilarious. Definitely, definitely. Ron, I just have to say thank you so much for coming on Behind the Scenes today. Uh, it oh. was a wonderful time in speaking with you. We always have a great time talking in general, but it was really nice just to hear about your background, um, your love of journalism, your love of bodybuilding, and what would you say right now to young people who are thinking about becoming bodybuilders? What would be the best advice you can give them right now? Uh, I would say, uh, take it seriously. Take your, if I could go back and change things, I would have taken nutrition seriously. You know, we see, we see the lifting is fun, but not everybody wants to eat every two hours. But if you can put all those things together, the training, the nutrition, get enough rest. But I'd say the mindset is you have to believe that you can, achieve your goals. Not everyone's going to look like a Jay Cutler, Ronnie Coleman, or Phil Heath, or R Big Rami. Very few people can look like that. But don't ever get discouraged. Don't ever compare yourself to those people. They're the genetic elite. Compare yourself to you. As long as you look better than the previous version of yourself, you're always winning. And you can always do that. It's all about self-improvement. Eventually, if you do get into competition, yeah, technically, you're going to be standing next to other people, and you're going to be compared and scrutinized and you might place first or last, depending on where you fit into that scenario and what the judges are looking at. But never give up, never give up, never get discouraged, because there will be times when you're not going to see results, but you just keep going and going. And eventually you see results again and you're not going to be encouraged by it. A lot of people are going to try to discourage you. It, that goes for any goal, obviously, in life. If you have if you have a, a goal that is considered very tough to achieve, a lot of people are just going to discourage you because they never went after their dreams and it was difficult. They didn't want to put the work in and they didn't want to keep going when times were tough. So, you know, I never gave up. And even though I never looked like Lee, Lee Haney or uh, Rich Gaspar or Lee Labrada, I did build, you know, a body that if, if you could show me at my, in my competitive prime to the 18 year old me, he would have been very pleased. He'd be like, wow. Okay. Okay. You didn't look like Lee Haney, but yeah, I'll take that. I'll take that for sure. So yeah, just don't give up guys. I always used to say that, never give up. Work hard, work smart and never give up. That's how I used to sign. I used to, when I used to sign these, I used to put that in there for everybody. <laughs> if you want, we can put a link to the description where they can buy that on Amazon so oh, they sure. can get real bodybuilding and also your other book, Evil Times 10. Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind. <laughs> Sounds good to me. 
cool. Well, Ron, thank you again. I can't thank you enough for being on the show today. Everyone, if you want to see this show every month, you've got to be a member because Behind the Scenes at Jen is the only place on MD where you're going to hear about upcoming news at MD, hear about behind the stuff, behind the scenes stuff at MD, and of course, get great guests like Ron Harris. Yeah, thanks for having me, Jen. It was great. It was my honor. Thank you very much. Until then, everybody, we'll see you next time. Thanks for joining us and have a great day.